Well, good afternoon to everybody. Today we have uh, our 19th day, uh, UNAM Chicago y el Centro de Investigaciones de Estudios del Norte. Give to all of you the warmest uh, welcome to this um, cycle, Diálogos del Bicentenario de las Relaciones Diplomáticas entre México y Estados Unidos. Now I'm going to introduce our participants, uh, el Dr. Emilio Rabasa Gamboa, He's originally from Tuxla Gutierrez, Chiapas. He received his law degree and doctorate in law from UNAM. Graduating with honors, he also completed a master's degree in philosophy and political science at the University of Cambridge, England, and a diploma at Harvard University. He's currently a full-time researcher at the Instituto de Investigaciones Jurídicas de la UNAM, professor of constitutional theory of constitutional law at the law school of the UNAM and both undergraduate and graduated level. He has taught at IPAM, UAM, UIA, UP, the Fletcher School of Law, and diplomacy in Boston, MA, and lecture at higher education institutions in Mexico, in Guanajuato, Colima, Coahuila, Acapulco, Guerrero, Oaxaca, Chiapas, Veracruz, Monterrey, Nuevo León, Jalisco, Puebla, and abroad in Cambridge and London in England, Regina in Canada, Santiago de Chile, and Valparaíso in Chile, Rome and Siena in Italy, Barcelona and Madrid in Spain, and uh, Houston, Chicago, Kent College of Law, Washington and Boston, Harvard, MIT, Boston University, Boston College, and UMA in the USA. In the public sector, he worked at the Mexican Social Security Institute, the Ministry of the Interior, and the National Human Rights Commission. In the diplomatic field, Dr. Rabasa served as Consul General of Mexico in Boston for New England from 2016 to 2018, and previously served as Ambassador of Mexico to the OAS for three years. Editorialist in several national newspapers, and author and co-author of several publications in law, philosophy, and politically political science. Thank you so much, Dr. Eh, Rabaza, for staying to, to us, eh, with us today. It's an honor for me to stay with you and learn from all of you. And he, now I'm going to introduce Dr. Kent Greenfield. He is an internationally recognized scholar for, of constitutional law and corporate governance. Kent Greenfield is a professor and the Dean's Distinguished Scholar at Boston School Law School. He has authored three trade books, including Corporations Are People Too, and They Should Act Like It for Yale University Press. He is also the author of two constitutional law e casebooks and the principal editor of the two Supreme Court volumes of Moore's Federal Practice, Lexit and Exit. Greenfield is a frequent public commentator on broadcast and cable news programs having appeared on CNN, MSNBC, NPR, BBC, Al Jazeera, and Fox. His essays have appeared in the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Atlantic, Slate, Boston, Global, American Prospect, Nation. He has also published over 4,000 scholarly articles in leading legal journals, including the Yale Law Journal and Virginia Law Review. Greenfield is an active participant in litigation matters pertaining to civil rights and corporate accountability. He was the founder and president of the Forum for Academic and Institutional Rights, the name and the plaintiff in a 2006 Supreme Court case that challenged the Pentagon's um, anti-gate policy. He was instrumental in developing the theory of the cases brought against Onokal Corporation and Hershey's Corporations for alleged human rights violations in Burma and West Africa. Additionally, he has authored several amicus briefs in Supreme Court matters, including in the cases of Masterpiece Case Shop versus Colorado Civil Rights Commissions and Trio Tree Creative versus Ellen's arguing that the Supreme Court should not extend the religious freedom rights to for-profit corporations. Having lectured at ne nearly 150, uh, no, 40, sorry, institutions in 45 different states and 11 countries, Greenfield has received four teaching awards while at Boston College, a graduate at Brown University and the University of Chicago Law School. He clerked for Justice David H. Sauer of the United States Supreme Court and practices at Covington and Borling in Washington, D.C. Dr. Ken Greenfield, it's an honor for me to stay with you. I'm trying to do uh, my best job. I, I hope uh, uh, that you feel comfortable. And of course, uh, all the audience can, uh, can learn from all of you because I know it's a, a very great opportunity. Um, Dr. Emilio Rabasa, we were talking about the uh, six idioms 
uh, at, at least a comparison of constitutional change in both countries, USA and Mexico, our constitutional structure, our mechanisms to enforce rights and human rights, the form of government in both constitutions and the role and power of the highest courts in the both nations. Our Supreme Court is under criticism for being an arm of the political branches. So uh, our first uh, comment, it will, it will be about what do you think about these, these items? First of all, I want to thank UNAM Boston and uh, UNAM uh, Chicago for this wonderful organization of the bicentennial of their relationships between our two countries. I am particularly grateful to Hector, who had been uh, very active in um, inviting me and reminding me that we had today this very important meeting. It is certainly for me a pleasure to be in the same space with Professor Kent Greenfield from Boston College, an institution which I got to know while I was general consul of Mexico in Boston and for which I have great regards. I uh, uh, certainly welcome the opportunity to exchange views on our two constitutions in a, an exercise of uh, constitutional comparative law. Uh, something that um, unfortunately has not been developed uh, regarding our two uh, Magna Cartas. I think there is a lack of literature of a, a study in both uh, constitutions. My grandfather, Oscar Rabasa, who graduated uh, from um, the University of Philadelphia, studied the American legal system. And when he uh, got back to Mexico, he wrote a treaty called Tratado de Derecho Anglo-Americano, Anglo-American Law Treaty, only in Spanish, where he advanced some comparison of a selected number of institutions between our two legal systems together with the English system. But uh, it is not exactly a text on comparative constitutional law between our two texts. So I really hope that this opportunity of this conversation takes us to the possibility of um, writing a text for which I would uh, kindly invite Professor Ken Greenfield about both constitutions the constitutions of Mexico and the United States that, as we shall see during this um, talk, they have certain features in common, but certainly wide differences. And it is, uh, I think, very important for uh, partners in the Treaty of Free uh, Commerce between ourselves and neighbors to have a clear understanding of these uh, constitutions. My father, who was also professor of law, wrote a book about the three constitutions of Canada, United States, and Mexico, uh, the three partners to the um, free trade agreement, but uh, not exactly a comparison of the um, parts the dogmatic part and the organic part of our two texts, which I, I believe we are still lacking. So I, I should uh, understand this talk as a beginning of a wider communication between our two uh, institutions, our two countries, between Boston College of Law and the 
National University of Mexico, the Institute of Legal Studies, where I work, and to further um, collaborate in this endeavor. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Doctor. Uh, it's very interesting what you are talking about. Uh, I'm sure we have uh, similarities with our uh, neighborhoods, but I'm sure we have a wild differences. So it will be in the future uh, of this uh, talk. I'm sure uh, we can uh, know uh, much much more about this. Talk to Doctor Kent. Sorry, Doctor Kent Greenfield. Gracias, uh, buenas, buenas tardes y, uh, y gracias por invitarme. Es un honor estar aquí. Um, and forgive me for having to switch to Spanish because your English is likely better than my Spanish, although I'm, I continue to, to try to Im improve. Um, thank you for that very gracious introduction, um, Martha. And, and, and uh, Dr. Rabasa, is, is very, um, it's an honor for me to be here with you to, to begin this conversation. And I, I am absolutely dedicated to continue this conversation, uh, not just between our two universities, but between our, our two nations that, that um, uh, uh, you know, for, that because we are so close and yet, uh, yet so far in so many, so many ways. Let me also say that I'm, it's just a pleasure for me to be here um, under the auspices of CISEN and, and UNAM. And thank you also to Hector uh, for uh, facilitating this. I, I have a, a soft spot for UNAM. My older uh, son is actually living in Mexico City right now. He's, an, uh, he's a writer and teacher in Mexico City. Uh, my younger son, uh, when we visited Mexico City, has adopted the UNAM Pumas as his favorite, um, uh, favorite Mexican soccer team. So, uh, and it was sporting an UNAM Pumas jersey recently. When he went to went to school here in in, in Boston, and so I'm um, I'm I'm looking forward to continuing these conver these conversations, um, and I hope to be able to to do this in person uh, and leave Zoom behind um, uh, sooner rather than later. So maybe what I should do, um, uh, as, as just by way of introduction, is that I I, I am uh, very interested in, in learning more about the the Mexican Constitution in this conversation and, and to do this comparative work. But let me start by talking perhaps a f for a few minutes about some of the things that I think are quite distinctive um, in, in, in about the U.S. Constitution. And I think once we have this groundwork established, I think it's it will become clear how um, uh, some of the important ways in which our constitutions differ and I think it also the, 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 the situation, it will become clear for those of you who are not, or who are not in the United States uh, why the, the, the Constitution is, plays such a sort of um, pivotal role, not only in our law, but also in our politics here in the United States. One of the things that, that uh, I always start my introductory constitutional law class with is I invite my students and require my students to, to read the entire text. And if, if you don't know it, you know, that might come as, a, as an assignment that is, uh, seems daunting. But the Constitution of the United States is quite short. It's, it's you know, I, I, mine is quite worn at this point with, with taped edges, but it's only 5,000 words long. And so it, uh, you can read it in, in uh, a few minutes, cover to cover, and it's uh, quite, Quite short, and therefore quite vague. I mean, I think that there are historical reasons why it's short. I think the the amount of agreement that that our founders could achieve um, over very, even very fundamental uh, questions of the day were was quite was quite thin. And so I think they chose to write a document that was at a high level of generality, using vague generalities, um, and and. and and therefore left us a document that's quite quite thin and, and small. You can sort of see it there. Um, and one of the implications of, of this, uh, oh, the, the other thing that I should say is that not only is it small and thin and vaguely worded, it is very hard to amend, very hard to change. Uh, it, uh, in order for an amendment to go through, you have to have a supermajority, a two-thirds vote of, the, of both houses of Congress. 
um, and then it has to go to the states for ratification of those of those amendments. And three quarters of the states, seventy five percent of the states, have to uh, have to ratify any change. And so what that means in reality is that the this document has been amended very um, seldomly. We have only had twenty seven amendments in two hundred and thirty years, and ten of those occurred right at the at the uh, at the framing the Bill of Rights. Two of those were right after, were right after that in the late seventeen um, hundreds, early eighteen hundreds, and so therefore we've we've had fifteen amendments in in two hundred years. The most recent one was in nineteen ninety two, and that had been originally proposed in seventeen ninety two. So it took two hundred years for our most recent amendment to be to be uh, to be ratified, and um, and. What's more, most of those, many of those amendments were, are sort of procedural or structural, you know, the, the capping the number of times someone can run for president or, or um, changing the age of, of that you can, uh, uh, of citizens to vote. So it's not, there aren't that many rights-based um, amendments, and those amendments too are, are, are written very vaguely. For example, in the the three amendments that were passed after the our Civil War, one um, in the ending slavery, one guaranteeing the right to vote, um, uh, uh, regardless of of of, um, of race. The other is 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 the amendment that so many of our cases are 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 uh, are about the Fourteenth Amendment. It really guarantees the right of liberty, of due process. Um, and of equal protection, and those and those uh, phrases are just that that general. You know, we we every American citizen uh, or every person is guaranteed liberty, but what does that mean? Well, I think what that uh, what it means is that the interpretation of those words is the entire ballgame. Right? What does liberty mean? Um, does it mean the ability to marry someone of the same sex? Does it uh, does it mean the ability to, to terminate your uh, a, a pregnancy does it does it mean um, the 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 ability to to determine where your kids go to school? Those are all questions that the court has has answered uh, over time. But but there's no there's not much guidance that you can find from the text itself. So interpretation becomes key. Um, th- these words, what does liberty mean? And then, of course, that turns on who decides. And early on in our uh, constitutional history, our Supreme Court said, well, it's us who decides. We are the last, uh, we have the last say in what the law is. Uh, and, and what that has, has meant is that um, in the United States, we have the most powerful Supreme Court of anywhere in the world. We have the most powerful judiciary of anywhere in the world. The judiciary can can strike down laws um, that both other branches of government, the presidency and the and and the Congress, both think are constitutional, both think are appropriate. And not only does this power of of so called judicial review uh, extend to the Supreme Court, but also extends to any federal judge anywhere in the country. In fact, there was just an argument yesterday at the United States Supreme Court about a law, uh, about actually a guidance that the Biden administration had put into place about who um, should be deported or not, where our limited enforcement uh, uh, resources should be placed. And there was, uh, and that guidance that Biden put into, uh, President Biden had put in place uh, was struck down by one federal judge in Texas. And that single judge was able to Stop the entire Biden effort to prioritize um, who should be dis- deported and who should not. So our, um, I think the thing to 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 note is that um, you know because our constitution is so vague, so general, it, sh- it is in effect shifts so much power to the judiciary to say what the law is, and that power is. Uh, is is uh, pretty deeply embedded, not just in the Supreme Court, but in every single federal judge around the country. And I think, I think that has impacts on on our politics. You know, who gets to appoint these judges? Whether it's um, Donald Trump or or 
uh, Joe Biden makes a huge difference in the lives of everyday Americans in ways that that might strike um, might might strike some from other, other countries as unusual or um, even inappropriate. So let me let me pause there. Thank you so much. I think uh, the kids, uh, as you say, said, sorry, um, USA on articles, Mexico, Mexico has 136 articles, less articles, less changes or modifications. It means the kids interpretation and confidence maybe in the systems, uh, system, maybe in the judges. What do you think about this, Dr. Rabasa? Well, first of all, Let's talk about the extension uh, uh, issue. You know? um, certainly, that is a huge difference. Uh, ours is 135, uh, 136 articles long, whereas the US uh, Constitution has uh, only uh, five articles, although each article has a section. And in each section, there are uh, cert uh, several sub-articles. So all in all, if we add them all, it, it, it is certainly more than five, but never 136. How can we explain this? <clears throat> History. Mexico belongs to a tradition, constitutional tradition, which started in the Constitution of 1824. We have had three federal constitutions, 1824, 1857, 1917, where the framers were to a certain extent influenced by the European tradition of white texts, of long texts. If you check, on the Spanish constitution, on the German constitution, on the French constitution, they are not short texts as the American one. They are also long texts. So we belong to that long text tradition where the framers, the so-called fathers of the constitution, sought to establish not only the wide principles of government, but the whole structure of the state, um, as in the Constitution of the United States, it is divided in two parts, the so-called dogmatic part that is concerned with the Bill of Rights and the organic part, which is concerned with the organization of the Mexican state at large, not only at federal level, but also at local level. The framers of the American Constitution were not bound by that European tradition. Uh, their metropoly was England. It was Great Britain, which has a non-written constitution. So the reference was not the type of long written text. That's why they searched for something smaller, more straightforward. And also we must remember that this was the second intent after the text of the Confederation failed and they, they decided to go for the Federation text. So that explains why it's not capricious, it's historical, the difference in size between the two, uh, the two texts. The American, text is more straightforward with the um, three, the division of powers, starting with the legislative branch in Article 1st, then the executive branch in Article 2, and then the judicial uh, branch in Article 3, and then Article 4 on the Federation. They never include, except in Article 4, Section 3, they don't include a wide definition of the form of government, uh, whereas we do have it in Article 40. The only thing they, uh, they 
established in, in this section is Article 4, Section 3, 2, says, uh, Section 4, the United States shall guarantee to every state in this union a republic a republican form of government that's the only mention of republic in reference to the states whereas we have a wide concept in article 40 of our constitution says it is the will of the mexican people to establish a republic representative federative democratic and then there was a lighter, a, a, a recent reform re, uh, re related to laicism. So we have a huge definition of our form of government in Article 40 of the Constitution. And then there are several articles that are dedicated to establish all the rules of this form of government of the Republic, of the representation, of the Federation, of democracy, and of licenticism in religion. That makes a big difference. The other big difference was mentioned by Professor uh, Ken Greenfield, and it's very important. In 200 years, or more than 200 years, of um, the uh, existence of the American constitutions, as he mentioned, you have had not more than 30 reforms, 27, and most of them, at least 10, regarding the Bill of Rights. Whereas we have now gathered 700 reforms only in the Constitution of 1917, not considering the reforms of the Constitution of 1857, which were also in the hundreds. But just referring to our constitution of 1917, we jo who just accomplished his centennial, first constitution that has lived for more than 100 years in Mexico, 700 re constitutional reforms. Why? There is also an explanation which was um, mentioned by Professor Kent. Americans, are bound by the tradition of judicial interpretation of the Constitution by the Supreme Court. The Constitution is what the Supreme Court, the justices, says is the Constitution, said, say is the Constitution. So they are the reformers of the Constitution. For example, and he mentioned it uh, quite clearly just recently regarding um, abortion. Before it was permitted, now it is prohibited. Or regarding uh, the rights of marriage of persons of the same sex. We are bound by a different tradition. Also very much European, continental, very French, which is we rely not so much on the interpretation of our Supreme Court to actualize our constitution, but on the legislative branch, on our legislators. We change our constitution by legislative process, not by judicial process. And that is a wide difference because it requires the whole process of constitutional reform, two-thirds majority of Congress, um, simple majority of the states, et cetera, et cetera, which is a very complicated process. But so far, we are still bound by it to the extent that while we are talking now, there is a new bill of a constitutional reform about electoral organization of elections. Now, right at this moment, the big issue in Mexico, the big political issue for which there were two recent public manifestations 
in the streets, one on the 13th, another one on the 27th, is the constitutional reform of the electoral system. The Lopez Obrador administration has a view of that organization, which is different from the present organization and wants to change it, but he doesn't have the majority in Congress to do so. So we are still holding to that practice of constitutional change and constitutional reform through the legislative process, not through the judicial process. This doesn't mean that our Supreme Court does not interpret the Constitution and also in that interpretation hold different views. As a matter of fact, they just passed a resolution yesterday, very, very important and very delicate about the permanence of the military on the streets um, um, beyond 2024. Did he, this is a new interpretation of the Constitution because before that resolution, it said they were could only uh, be outside by the call of the executive branch up to 2024. And uh, Mr. Lopez Obrador sent a bill to expand that time to more than 2024 to 2029. It went through a whole series of debates. And finally, the Supreme Court yesterday ruled that yes, they can remain beyond 2024. Now, that is a very significant, very significant interpretation of the Constitution on the text of the, the remaining of the, of the troops of the army in the barracks or in the streets. So we have the two systems, but certainly the most important one, the, the strongest one, the prevailing one is the legislative, not the judicial. Whereas in the United States, as Professor Kent mentioned, it, is the judicial. So I would say that these are the two biggest differences between our two constitutions, the extent and the Re constitutional reform process. There are others, of course, but mainly these are the two more significant. Thank you so much, Doctor. Um, uh, Doctor Kent, I think uh, about uh, why Doctor Rabasa was challenged. Um, it should be the judge uh, rolling a play like a permanent legislator, or there are uh, two different. It's this working like uh, mechanisms to enforce rights, or it, do you think you need to change something? Ray, what a, what a, what an interesting question. Be, because in part, um, you know, as I mentioned before, the the um, the our our constitution is so th vaguely worded, and our our uh, and our conception of rights. Um, is so dependent on judges, as uh, Dr. Arbasa has, has mentioned. It's, it's. I think we have a actually a very constrained view of rights and rights enforcement here. And, and let me just say say um, a few more things about that broadly. Um, I think one of the things that I've noticed about the U.S. Constitution compared to compared to others around the world is that we are much stingier, much um, less robust in our explicit recognition of rights. We have a few here, you know, the Bill of Rights are, is of course um, uh, listed among the, our most important uh, rights as U.S. citizens. You know, the First Amendment is about, um, about uh, religion and, and speech. You have our, our, our protections of criminal defendants in the Fourth, Fifth, and Sixth Amendments. Um, but we don't. What uh, and then, of course, in the Fourteenth Amendment, after the Civil Rights, uh, after the Civil War, our Civil War, you know, we have pr some protection um, of equality, some protection of liberty, but there's no there's no um, uh, protection of many substantive and affirmative rights. You don't have an affirmative right to 
education. You don't have an affirmative right to housing. You don't have an affirmative right to um, a dignified income. You don't have an affirmative right to a safe environment. Um, you, you don't have um, uh, an affirmative right to health care. All of which you can you you see in varying degrees in other other national constitutions. So those rights are not uh, when they exist. They don't come uh, usually from courts. They have to come from legislatures, and then you have to look again at our at our um, legislative structure. And here again, I think the United States has taken a view that that. Um, uh, that, that the structure that, that this original document created makes it incredibly difficult to get anything done. And, you know, and, you, and you've probably been seeing this from, from afar here in the United States. Uh, in order to get a law passed, um, you know, you, it has to, a proposal has to go through uh, the House of Representatives, then the Senate, then it gets signed by the president. And it's quite rare for all three of those bodies to be in the hands of, of, uh, of the same party. Uh, and even when so, there, there are many impediments built into the system, sort of not really in the Constitution, but, but quasi-constitutional, like the filibuster in the Senate, which requires a supermajority vote to get things through the Senate. And so what that means you you have a huge bias toward the status quo and a, and a very and a difficulty uh, for the federal government to legislate and I'm amazed to hear that you've had 700 constitutional reforms in, in a little over a century uh, it would be amazing to have uh, our Congress being able to agree on anything 700 times over the course of a century um, and and it's uh, and I think the problem in uh, arises in particular in, in the areas of, of, constant, of electoral reform, as Dr. Hibasa has, has mentioned, because here in the United States, there's always going to be an embedded um, uh, incumbency that, that doesn't want constitutional or electoral reform. And those reforms are incredibly difficult to, to effectuate by way, of, by way of the bodies that benefit from the current status quo. Courts do not feel empowered to change that, um, or courts have not to date been empowered to change that, except around the edges. And so we find ourselves, uh, and I'm sure as you've looked at from afar, in, in sort of this uh, stagnant nature where, where it's, uh, states can take away voting rights. Uh, there, there's, un, there's lack of clarity around um, presidential secession in some circumstances, like we saw around January 6th. Um, and, and, and I think it's part, and so much of this, really, I, th I lay at the, um, at the feet of the, the framers who created the system. And let me just make something else explicit about uh, the reason why we find ourselves here in the United States at this place. Uh, and I think if you once you sort of peel away the history of our of our original document, you know, uh, created 230 years ago, um, it it uh, had to come to terms with our nation's original sin, which is slavery. It it um, it we didn't could not ratify this document without the agreement of of the southern states, and the southern states would not agree to join a national compact that didn't guarantee the ability of the Southern states to maintain slavery uh, for certain periods of time into the future. And, and it took us uh, a, you know, a century and a civil war to end slavery, and a civil war that cost the lives of over half a million Americans. But the vestiges of slavery still exist in this document. And, you know, and I'm not just talking about um, the, the uh, fugitive slave clause that, that obligated states to return slaves to their masters or the three-fifths clause that gave southern states uh, extra representation in Congress based on the number of, of, of people they enslaved. I'm talking about the very framework of our constitution that, that preserved the power of, of small rural states in the United States Senate, Senate for example, um, which was in, in part embedded on the notion of we had to protect, the framers had to protect the interest of, of slave-owning states 
in the Senate and by extension the presidency because as you may know, the, our presidential system is sort of a state by state vote based on the number of electoral votes. Electoral votes are in part based on the number of, um, of, of people that they, it's basically the total of the number of people in Congress they have plus the number of senators. And mathematically that, that gives states like Wyoming um, uh, a disparate, which is rural, um, uh, underpopulated, disproportionate amount of power, both in the Senate and in the presidency. Uh, and so you have states like, like Texas or like, like California that are underrepresented in uh, the Senate, underrepresented in the presidential elections. And so what you have is you have a sort of an embedded status quo orientation and difficulty in trying to amend um, this document to make legislative changes. And so when we think about, I think, the real threats to, uh, to a continued vibrant democracy that we are experiencing here in the United States, uh, protections of voting rights, protections of, of basic uh, ability to, 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 to live, protections of, of health care, um, uh, pr protections of, of people on the basis of their sexual orientation and, and race, and sex, um, those things really cannot be dependent any longer on courts. They have to be dependent on our legislature and our Congress. And and there are um, and Congress itself is skewed because of this document um, in favor of rural um, and uh, less populate, populated places. And, and it allows sort of the existing status quo to be embedded in the law. And I think this is uh, uh, an enduring difficulty that, uh, that the United States is going to have to face. And it doesn't sound like, Dr. Durbasa, that, that Mexico faces the same kind of embedded status quo bias. Thank you so much, Dr. Greenfield. Dr. Rabasa, would you like to, to add something about this important item? About yes, the, I, 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 um, uh, I certainly agree um, with, with uh, Professor Kent's uh, comments and, and the embedment of, of, the, of the status quo in the United States and in Mexico. We have uh, um, um, <clears throat> presented the, the main difference between our two constitutions. There are, of course, another uh, similarities, uh, mostly, I would say, in the, um, in the judicial branch, for example. Um, some um, Mexican historians believed that our federation was a copy of the American federation of the, your constitutions. Even my father, who was a constitutional uh, professor, thought so, that the um, American Constitution had influenced our uh, Constitutional Congress of 1824 to establish the Federation in Mexico. I made um, some research about it and found out that it is not the case if we compare, for example, the articles of both texts regarding the Federation, they are absolutely quite different, quite different. But not only that, paradoxically, the, um, the root of our Federation was brought from the constitution of Cadiz when they developed what was called the provincial, provincial deputies that were, that were implanted in Mexico and that grew up as the states. So the, um, the roots, the, uh, the origins of our federation is different from the federation of the United States. Other than that, there is also similarity regarding the constitutional reform process of two thirds majority, although the United States requires also two thirds in the states and we require all simple majority, but we could make a long list of, of uh, similarities. I am uh, happy to hear that Dr. Kent also referred to the rights. This is also another 
uh, theme very, very important. We tend to put rights in our constitution every time we can. As a matter of fact, our constitution of 1917 was born with what was called the social rights, like rights of the peasants and rights of the labormen um, in Articles 27 and 123. And then we established the right of housing and the rights of health, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, although those rights have not been fully extended uh, so far into the population. But we are also very um, for established in our text. Now, having said this, I would like to, uh, if we are still have five minutes, to issue that is very much um, at present. And it is a thing that some people will not happen either in the Constitution of the United States Constitution of Mexico. Both were texts that were, let's say, untouchable from any uh, political um, force. But now, with the rise of populism in both countries, the United States under Trump and ours, uh, there's, there is the question to what extent is our constitutions, our respective constitutions, exposed to this um, movement of populism? Uh, for me, what happened in the United States on the 6th of January 2021 was a brutal attack of Trump to the Constitution of the United States and also all the interference he made in trying to revert the electoral resorts, even calling, calling local officials to try to find votes for him. So that was a, a, a strong attack on your constitution. Do you think that the uh, both texts are still under that high risk of, of uh, populism attack? <clears throat> I do, I, I do. I don't want to speak for Mexico, but I certainly think that that our constitution and, in fact, our our political structure is 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 continued continues to be under risk at risk um, for those kinds of attacks. And one of one and one of the reasons I I think that is that in part because you know that there's so many compromises that we have that we've papered over or lived through over the last. 230 years. And the oddity about that January 6th, uh, I think it was a, an attempted coup, essentially. Um, what, what was happening there was, you know, both sides thought they were they were fighting on behalf of the Constitution. And that cannot be true. Both sides were not fighting on behalf of the Constitution. But our difficulty is that our Constitution is written at such a high level of generality, both sides can think that. Um, but the reality is that uh, that that cannot be true, and, um, and and we have to make it much more explicit here in the United States that that um, that that so many things that we have entrusted to the president, for example, is really not in the text, but is a is a subject of is a product of is a is a product of of norms, and it looks like we have a. Um, I think we are having a kind of a, a, zoom, a, a zoom bomber. Uh, but uh, we need, I'm so sorry, we need um, the help from the, uh, I don't know who Hector. has. Uh, uh, Hector, we have to cancel that image. Administration, the administration. Okay. Go ahead. Necesitaríamos que los expulsaran de la sala. So sorry to the audience. We have a trouble here in the in the Zoom, but uh, we are going to continue with uh, Kent Greenfield. Which was, um, I'm so sorry, uh, Dr. Greenfield. We apologize because of the happen. No worries. No worries. Uh, 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 yeah, it's not your fault at all. Uh, so I, all I would say is that I think. Um, one of the things that became clear after January 6th is so much of what we depend on here in the United States is a product of norm. 
and product of principles that, uh, of, of, of adherence to, to uh, fidelity of, to the Constitution rather than what's in the text itself. And I think the, the failure of, of um, Donald Trump uh, in particular to abide by those norms, I think expose, exposes the weakness of our constitutional text to address these kinds of, of um, uh, outlandish situations. What, what really um, amazed me, and I am very, very um, uh, gratefully surprised, is the resilience of both constitutions, in both cases, not to let populism undertake the, the constitution uh, in, in, in each country. Uh, whereas in, in the United States and in, 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 in Mexico, that, which means that the constitutional mechanism to protect the supremacy of the constitution above all existing powers is, is still working. And I am very, very happy for that. Unfortunately, we are five minutes to one. I want to thank the organizers. I want to thank Marta, the moderator. And mostly, I want to thank my colleague, Ken Greenfield. I hope we continue to collaborate between our two institutions and maybe come up with a, a comparative constitutional text between the Mexican and the American constitution in English and Spanish. Thank you awesome. very, very much. Thank, thank, thank you, thank you for inviting Zavala. me. Vamos al tri, no? <laughs> well, uh, Vamos al... Well, so very difficult, but yes. I don't want to, to talk about football. It's, I don't know nothing <laughs> about that. But I want to thank to all of you, of course. Um, Esmeralda Martínez, Samuel Martínez, uh, Salvador España, uh, que, uh, who are uh, people who work with the uh, Centro de Investigación sobre América del Norte de la UNAM. Desde luego a uh, Alberto Fonserrada, que es de la UNAM Chicago, y a Héctor Zavala de UNAM Boston, and all the people who work uh, with uh, CISAN, UNAM, and absolutely our uh, most grateful uh, thing, um, thing to uh, Dr. Rabasa, Dr. Kenfield, and uh, please, I, I want to apologize because of the trouble we, we have here just for a few minutes. It's been an honor, and I'm sure uh, it will be this, um, this dialogue, it will be contribute, uh, contribute to legal uh, knowledge and absolutely to improve and uh, uh, understand and take a better practices about everything uh, we are talking about, our constitutional changes, and uh, of course, mechanisms to enforce rights and human rights. So thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Let Mexico win. Mm -hmm.